I want to welcome everybody today. Uh, thank you so much. It was relatively short notice and I, I can already see close to 100 people uh, in this forum. So I can only thank everybody for attending. Uh, this is the first of many uh, lectures or should we call it engagement and discussions uh, of uh, organized by the Department of Fashion and Textiles University of Huddersfield. Now, why we are doing it? We are doing it because we want to show uh, many stakeholders, as many as possible, internal, our students, our colleagues, externally, the anybody who is related with fashion and textiles community, even beyond that, the importance of this particular industry means you like it or not, many of the global challenges relate back to this industry. And this industry can actually solve many of the global challenges. Means uh, if you look sustainability, this industry can actually input from environmental, from economical, from societal aspects. And we wanted to create a public forum where we are discussing about that. We are discussing the challenges. We are discussing how together we can work together. We can be proud of our heritage, but we accept that this industry is cutting edge and we need to do it to solve global problems like microfibers going into our ocean and so on and so forth. So again, welcome uh, for uh, in this inaugural lecture series now. To introduce this lecture series, I, I am so lucky and privileged that my friend and colleague, uh, Adam Mansell, uh, agreed to join us today. Uh, Adam is Chief Executive Officer of UK Fashion and Textiles Association. UKFT does a fascinating job, and I really mean it, uh, to bring together technologists, scientists, designers, uh, you, you name it in this supply chain, they does a fabulous job to bring all of them together uh, in one environment to create a, a agenda, which is for the industry, for this supply chain. And they do lobbying, they represent spinning, weaving, knitting right through catwalk. They have every stakeholder into their disposal. Uh, they are very active with research community and that is where I got the privilege of knowing Adam. Uh, Adam is the chair of the steering committee of uh, Future Fashion Factory. I'm sure Adam will talk about that as well. And, and Adam is actually part of this industry from mid 90s. I'm not giving away his age. I'm just saying he's part of this industry from mid 90s and he actually worked in various aspects of the supply chain. So I really know people who knows this supply chain in more details than Adam. Uh, he works with wholesalers, he works with fiber manufacturers, spinners, so on and so forth, right to the retail uh, sector. So I'll hand over the virtual say, stage to Adam now. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Parik, for that, that very warm, warm welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as Parik has said, uh, my name is Adam Mansell, um, and I have the privilege of, of being the CEO of the UK Fashion and Textile Association. And thank you all very much indeed for taking the time to join me this afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be kicking off this series of lectures on the fashion and textile industry. Um, and I do urge you to sign up to listen to the other speakers. Uh, I'm lucky enough actually to know all the other speakers, and I know they'll give you some great insights into this industry and the challenges and opportunities it faces. Uh, next week's speaker is Oli Platz. Now, Oli's the MD of a very high-end weaver called Joshua Ellis, based up the road in Batley. And Joshua Ellis was founded in 1767, and it's a company that survived and thrived for 253 years. So it'll be absolutely fascinating to hear Oli talk about the plans for the future. And later on in the series, I know that Susie Shepherd will be talking about some of the hidden mills of Yorkshire. And I'll be talking a lot about the mills uh, around these parts uh, as I go through my talk this afternoon. I'm gonna talk briefly about UKFT, about what we do, go into a little bit more depth of the stuff that, that Parik touched on earlier. And then I'm gonna try and give an overview of the industry 
um, what the key issues are in the industry at the moment, uh, where the industry might be going. <clears throat> but I'm also very keen that this afternoon is a discussion. So after I've done my bit, I'd be really interested in taking questions and to see whether we can generate some interesting debate between us all. Most of my talk this afternoon will, I'll, be in, I'll, I'll talk about the UK industry a lot in this, in this talk this afternoon, but the fashion and apparel supply chain is a hugely global interconnected uh, supply chain. So pretty much everything I'll be talking about, whilst I'm referencing the UK, all of the issues I'll be talking about will apply across the whole of the globe. There's virtually no country in the world that doesn't have some sort of fashion and textile industry. When I was uh, originally discussing this talk with the team at Huddersfield, I rather flippantly said that I'd try and do the whole talk without mentioning COVID, because I wanted this to be an upbeat uh, discussion about the future. But obviously, any talk at the moment has to refer to COVID and the impact that it's had on the industry. And like so many other sectors across, across all industries, the, the fashion and textile industry in the UK has suffered a lot because of COVID. UK manufacturers have lost around 95% of their orders. Big retailers cancelled billions of pounds of business from countries such as Bangladesh and Turkey. And exports, which are the lifeblood of our creative fashion industry, dried up altogether. And things haven't got much better yet, but better they will get. They definitely will. Just like that 253-year-old Joshua Ellis business, this is an industry that adapts and survives. We've done it before and we're doing it right now. But on to UKFT and what we do. So UKFT is the collective voice of the fashion and textile industry. And as Parik said, uh, we represent businesses throughout the entire supply chain, starting with the spinning, weaving and knitting manufacturers here in the UK, uh, all the way through to the catwalk and aftercare. And we also look after people like the industrial laundering side of the business as well. So we collectively, we look after about two and a half thousand businesses here in the UK. Some of them employ one people. Some of them are companies like Marks and Spencer's employing tens of thousands of people. My job is to promote the strategic and economic value of our vibrant industry to the government and to policymakers and ensure that the key issues for our sector are on their agenda. And what does that actually mean? Well, over the past seven or eight months, it won't surprise you to hear that I've been talking about pretty much nothing other than uh, COVID. So I've been heavily involved in discussions with the government both on how the industry can get involved to help mitigate some of the supply problems, particularly around PPE, but also on how the government could change the support it gives to industries. Um, so lots of things that, that changed throughout the COVID period in the UK, some changes in the furlough scheme, things like that, that came about because of the interaction between not just UKFT and government, but between lots of different business organisations and government. And prior to talking about COVID, uh, my, my, my other key topic of conversation with the government was around Brexit um, and what that means for the industry. And I'll touch very briefly on that towards the end of my talk. But as well as talking about those sort of key um, immediate issues like COVID and Brexit, I also spent a lot of time talking to, to ministers, to MPs, to the Prime Minister, to the Chancellor of the Exchequer about the importance of education, about the importance of exporting environmental issues, wages and working conditions, and, and most importantly of all, I guess, I talked to them all about the growth and importance of the UK fashion and textile industry. So as well as our, our representative role, talking, talking to government, and I also talked to, to, to uh, the government in Brussels as well, obviously, but we, we do a lot of practical work with businesses. So we give practical business advice and technical support to help companies grow. Um, we help companies with business plans, with market trends, logistics, IP advice, pricing issues, employment, and so much more. Um, we're committed to creating the right conditions for UK manufacturers to thrive and to help foster successful relationships between UK manufacturers and brands. I'll talk a bit more about UK manufacturing later on in my speech, but I think it's worth noting that a lot of the time that we hear about UK manufacturing, particularly around UK fashion manufacturing, it's all bad news. It's all the stories around Boohoo and the, the terrible illegal practices that go on in Leicester. But it's not all like that by any means. And one of my roles linking these two things together is to talk to the government, to talk to the Home Office, talk to the Department of Work and Pensions about how we make 
the atmosphere around manufacturing is better for the workers involved with it. For those students and potentially some of the brands that are, that are listening in, we've also got a free resource called letsmakeithere.org, so www.letsmakeithere.org, which is a free sourcing platform that features over 400 UK fashion and textile manufacturers. And all of those uh, manufacturers here in the UK are willing and able and wanting to work with UK designers and UK brands. And interesting, we've just done a project to translate that website into seven different languages. So one of the, the really exciting things that's happening in the UK manufacturing sector at the moment is we're seeing lots of brands from places like Japan and Korea wanting to get their products made here in the UK. So that, that site is now available in seven different languages, including Korean, Japanese, Chinese, uh, and a handful of European languages as well. One of our other key uh, activities, and this is another area where I interact quite a lot with Parrick, is around skills. Uh, we are something called the sector skills body, body for the uh, industry. Um, and we're heavily focused on addressing the critical skills gaps uh, and developing industry-led solutions to those skills gaps. Most recently, our work has been around promoting the wide variety of careers in our industry and supporting the next generation of talented employees to enter into our industry, as well as developing new vocational and academic routes into an industry that meet the needs of business. We just launched a three-year national skills campaign uh, with a uh, pop-up factory to let young people, their teachers and their parents know about the wide range of opportunities in the industry. Uh, and for any teachers listening in, um, we are hopefully coming to Huddersfield sometime next year. Uh, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible then. And we've also launched a, a new program recently aimed at developing the manufacturing knowledge of fashion graduates through a new internship scheme where we'll place five students a year with UK manufacturers and we'll pay them while they're there. We have an international team. Uh, that supports UK companies to reach new markets overseas. We're dedicated to raising the profile of UK fashion and textile companies around the world. And we provide export grants and support to over a thousand companies every year. And we've also recently started, uh, a, a, again, another three year campaign, an ambitious campaign to promote the textile manufacturing capacity and capability of the UK industry uh, to markets overseas. A bit like what we're doing with the translation of Let's Make It Here. We've got some amazing manufacturers here in the UK, and one of our roles is to tell the rest of the world about those manufacturers. And finally, we also uh, run something called UKFT Rise. And again, for the undergraduates listening in and for those who give you that setting up your own brands, UKFT Rise is a supportive community. It's free to join um, for early stage fashion and textile businesses. And we try and unite entrepreneurs who've got the passion, ambition and creativity to challenge the status quo of the, of the fashion industry. So if you are thinking about starting up your own brand, do check out the activities on UKFT Rise. The fashion and textile industry is extremely important to the UK's economy. We make over nine billion and a billion with a B pounds worth of fashion and textiles here in the UK every year, employing over 120,000 people that still actually make things. And they make things from couture dresses that can retail at over 20,000 pounds for one dress to 3D woven parts that are used in Jaguar Land Rovers. At wholesale prices, we export around 10 billion pounds worth of fashion and textiles to pretty much every country in the world. And we import around 25 billion pounds worth of fashion and textiles from pretty much every country around the world as well. And again, those are at wholesale prices. When it comes to retail in the UK, there's around 750,000 people working in fashion retail here in the UK. And as consumers, we spend around 70 billion pounds a year on fashion and textiles. And collectively, we put about 32 billion pounds in gross value added into the UK's coffers every year. So it is a significant industry. Now our clothes help define us. Um, yet the fabrics we wear have remained functionally pretty much unchanged for thousands of years. But recent breakthroughs in fiber materials and manufacturing processes will soon allow us to design and wear fabrics that see, that hear, that sense, communicate, store and convert energy. They will be able to regulate temperature, monitor our health and even change color. Perhaps we're at the start of a new fabric revolution. And I'm delighted that the technical 
uh, textile centre here at Huddersfield University is part of that revolution. And we've got a fantastic opportunity to shape the future landscape of the textile industry in the UK simply by building on what we already have. Textile innovation in the UK is ranked number three in the world and number one in Europe in terms of pattern generation. And a recent survey shows that spending on R&D in our industry stands at over 5% of turnover, and that's well above the average for all other manufacturing sectors. Just to reiterate those figures, number one in Europe, number three in the world in terms of textile innovation for pattern generation. We are an amazingly creative industry. What does that mean? Well, how about skin for robots that are made from woven textiles? Or a phone made of textiles that you can stuff into your pocket like a hanky? Camouflage that changes colour depending on your background. Fibres that deliver paracetamol directly to a patient's skin if their body temperature right reaches a certain point. All of these things are either being researched or being developed in a UK manufacturer or a UK university right now. Textile innovation can be found in the cars that we drive and in the cars that Lewis Hamilton drives. The roads we drive on, the planes and trains we use, or used to use perhaps, in operating rooms, in the battlefield, and even in the International Space Station. Very recently, uh, Virgin Galactic launched its new spaceware, uh, which will be used both by the customers and by its space pilots. And at $250,000 for a 90-minute space flight, I think a special space uniform is the least you could expect. But on more serious note, there are major, major growth opportunities for UK companies in medical textiles, advanced materials, composites, and in smart textiles. But we're seeing not only product innovation, but also process innovation as well. 3D weaving, 3D knitting, plasma-based surface treatments are all being commercially used in the UK. And these technologies aren't just for use in outer space. There's a company called McNair using plasma treatment to give a waterproofing coating to uh, their, their, their garments, just up the road from Huddersfield in a place called Slough. Um, and they're producing the amazingly coolest ski wear you could ever imagine using this amazing high-tech technology. And the use of non-wovens reaches them to virtually any industry that you could think of, from hospitals where it's used in masks and gowns, to ag agriculture where millions and millions of miles of fleece fabric is used every year to help grow crops to feed us all. And the Technical Textile Centre here at Huddersfield are working with British sheep farmers to look at new ways of processing British wool to make it more usable as a non-woven textile. New applications for materials like graphene and synthetic spider silk are now being commercially produced. Spider silk is many times stronger and much more flexible than Kevlar, for instance. They've got a huge range of issues, including perhaps in construction materials. So in the future, we might be looking at buildings that have been made with synthetic spider silk. And good old Google has even started to embed its Project Jacquard technology into Levi's denim jackets so that your jacket will buzz every time you've got a text. I'm not entirely sure that gets us very far, but interestingly, what it does point out, what it does highlight is the need for all parts of the textile innovation chain to work together because the technology in that $350 Google Levi jacket stops working after you've washed it just 10 times. Digitalization of manufacturing linked to an ever more sophisticated internet is disrupting the fashion sector. And as the environmental impact of the sector becomes more widely recognized, the need for sustainable manufacturing and sustainable fibers, fabrics, and fashion will undoubtedly become a huge driver of growth of both product innovation and processes, and also of how we care for our clothes after we've bought them. Now, mass, mass customization has, has been talked about for a very long time, but it's now being looked at through that lens of sustainability. Uh, and here at UKFT, we're supporting several really interesting projects where we're working with um, housing developers who want to develop retail hubs in, in housing developments, where the front of a, a shop, front of a new retail shop, would look exactly like a normal retailer. But in the back of that shop, there wouldn't be stock as there normally would be but there'd be machinery and highly skilled craftspeople who could turn individual orders into perfect fitting garments right there and then with no transport costs, no waste and no returns. Those are the sorts of movements in terms of sustainability and retail um, selling that we're gonna start seeing coming on stream more and more recently. 
But to capitalize on our success, we need to address a couple of key fundamental barriers to growth. That's business support and the development of a skills and career program to match the needs of the industry in 2030 and beyond. And we need to ensure that whatever interventions happen are appropriate for a sector where over 80% of our businesses are micro SMEs employing less than eight people. Unlike in many other countries, successive UK governments have failed to see the potential in investing in the textiles of the future. In the US, for example, the Department for Defense brought together 89 universities and manufacturers under the Advanced Future Fabrics of America program. It brings together federal and state governments, industry and academia, all under one institute, with a sole aim to accelerate technology transfer to enable revolutionary fashion and textile applications in both the commercial and defense sectors. And the federal government in the US have put in $75 million into this project. Similarly, in Russia, the government has recently announced in Russia that it plans to allocate $250 million to the design and production of tex technical textiles for use in the Russian military. In the UK, unfortunately, the government has squandered pretty much every opportunity it's had to invest in the UK industry. Despite having a huge audience of people who could benefit from advances in textiles, just think about the need for textiles in the military, in the police, in the fire service, the prison service, and the millions of people employed in the NHS. As a slight aside, frustratingly, the UK government failed to use the UK industry to, to meet the, its rapid need for the development of PPE to help protect against the coronavirus. Large numbers of companies in the UK made their production capacity available to the government. Companies from Barber to Burberry to small niche manufacturers who developed prototype reusable surgical gowns using technology that had originally been developed in the automotive and aerospace industry. But despite all of these offers of help, um, almost all the PPE that the government and now the UK government are now buying is and will remain, unfortunately, uh, bought from China and other, other major sourcing countries. And perhaps even more disappointing, disappointingly, it will continually continue to be single-use disposable PPE, uh, which is only going to add to the original already huge problem around textiles going to uh, landfill. Talking a bit more positively about uh, skills and careers and the image of the sector, a recent survey suggests that here in the UK, we'll need to attract 20,000 new entrants into the UK fashion and textile manufacturing sector alone to meet current demand. But we've got a problem in our industry in that we fail to make careers in making things appealing. We've 15,000 undergraduates on fashion design courses, and I know some of you will be listening in now. We've got precious few undergraduates on textile engineering courses, as an example. And we need to address this gap by ensuring that students are taught about the benefits of working with local manufacturing and about the business of fashion, as well as about the creativity of fashion. We have a great deal to do to promote the sector, to attract young people with IT skills. And if you think IT doesn't have a role in fashion and textiles, you might like to know that Parik and I are involved in a, a potential multi-million pound project with IBM. IBM are very, very keen to work with us to get into the fashion and textile industry. And we need graduates with expertise in chemistry and physics and biology. We need to develop and promote technical routes into the industry through higher level apprenticeships. There are now 15 new apprenticeship standards for our sector, and the UKFT is also helping write the content for a new T-level. T-levels are the new technical qualifications in England that are gonna come along, come on stream in a couple of years time, that will be an equivalent to an A-level, and there'll be an opportunity within that to study a fashion and textiles T-level. And we need to start planning now to make sure that we're developing staff that have got the skills that we'll all need in 10 years time. We may all be a little, weary of online learning right now. But one of the more exciting things that's come out of a, a project that Parik mentioned at the beginning called the Future Fashion Factory um, is the development of a virtual training environment where uh, a UK manufacturer is using VR technology to help train people to understand how to set up looms. So rather than having, these, having to stop production to train people, they've set up this virtual learning platform where they can see wearing a headset what a loom looks like and how to set it all up. It's an absolutely amazing project. But we also need to change uh, the way that the industry is perceived. Here in the UK and, and elsewhere across the world, the textile industry is wrongly seen as a place where you end up if you're not very good at school. But there are so many opportunities in this industry. 
There are over 70 different jobs in this sector, from designer to buyer, from textile technologist to product developer. And these are all jobs with a future and jobs with really decent salaries. Major retailers now are absolutely crying out for garment technologists. There's a huge shortage of garment technologists. And I think there's only one degree course uh, left in the UK that teaches garment tech. The starting salary for a garment tech in a, in a UK retailer is £30,000. That's just the starting salary. Or how about being a cutter uh, for a traditional tailor? Head cutters on Savile Row earn six-figure salaries, and all of them learnt on the job. In places like China, Japan, and the US, UK-made goods are seen as the very best and command a huge premium. The fabric woven and finished here in West Yorkshire, the knitwear produced in Scotland, and the shoes made in Northampton have a world-leading brand profile built on heritage and provenance, and we need to take that and put some pride back into the careers in making things. I've already mentioned uh, the aerospace industry and the automotive industries, uh, where there are careers for those with fashion and textile experience. But how about a career in the film and uh, uh, theatre industry, for instance? You might be surprised to know that UK textiles and clothing have featured in countless films, from Bond to Harry Potter, and in places like the Royal Opera House. In the Royal Opera House, you can get specialist training for costume makers. And there's an amazing career path for people in costume design, and I know that's one of uh, the Huddersfield Fashion Department specialists as well. So lots of people start by doing a fashion uh, degree course and then move into all sorts of different other avenues in the industry. The way we buy clothes and the way that they are delivered will also definitely change in the immediate future. COVID has accelerated the uh, growing move to online and brands and retailers, as well as events like fashion, London Fashion Week, are investing heavily in immersive fashion, immersive, immersive shopping experiences, using haptics and virtual reality, so that you'll be able to touch and feel and see a garment through your computer. You'll be able to look at something on the screen and be able to virtually touch it and feel it and see what it, how it handles, what the fabric feels like in your fingers, even though you're not actually touching it. And everyone from the NHS to DHL is investing in drone and robot technology to speed up delivery. And if you think the idea of drones flying through Huddersfield sounds far-fetched, I urge you to go and check out Amazon's plans for their new airborne fulfillment centers. These are amazing looking things and they've got a patent on them, so they might just happen. They're massive floating warehouses. They're gonna hover about 100 feet above big cities around the world and where they're just gonna take the drones from these floating platforms and deliver stuff to our doorsteps. But how clothes and fabrics uh, are made will also change rapidly in the near future. In China already, there are factories producing five pocket Western jeans where every single manufacturing stage is automated and carried out by robots. Major retailers around the world are investing in sobots to bring reliable production closer to the market. Now, the use of robots in the fashion and textile manufacturing industry has the potential to become the next major change. Because despite the fact that companies still chase the cheapest, cheapest needle around the world, wages still account for the largest part of making up a garment. And replacing that skilled human with a robot eliminates all the CSR issues overnight. It removes costs, it increases productivity, and it minimizes factory shutdowns. But whilst robots might remove the need for social compliance auditing for large brands and retailers, I do wonder what on earth is going to happen to those hundreds of thousands of garment workers around the world. What will they do to earn a living when robots take their place? Now, I've already mentioned sustainability as, as a driver for change. And it's often quoted that the fashion and textile industry across the globe is the second most polluting industry on the planet. That's a sobering and dreadful statistic. And we should all think very carefully about how we can change our personal behavior to make a small impact on that. But again, if we look at our UK manufacturing industry here, the textile companies right here in Huddersfield are amongst the most environmentally efficient in the world. Companies here take pride in the fact that they water, that the water that they put back after processing, when they put it back into the environment, it's pristine. They're the most highly energy efficient companies in the, on the planet. Waste materials used by manufacturers here up in Yorkshire are collected and recycled into all sorts of different end uses. 
But the increasing focus on sustainability has lots of opportunities, lots and lots of opportunities. How about buttons made from potatoes or coffee grounds even? Or how about cotton grown hydroponically in the center of London? Or alternatives to leather made with pineapple fiber or even denim made with banana fiber? Well, it might surprise you to know that all of these are available right now. And I even have a pair of the banana fiber jeans. The coffee grounds and the potatoes, they're developing all sorts of plastic uh, uses for those recycled materials. Um, they're working with a very large chip manufacturer and using the potato peelings to turn it into a type of plastic and they're developing glasses and, and, and buttons and all sorts of things. So there's huge amounts of opportunities out there. And just to take one tiny segment of the enormous textile industry, how about making a wet wipe out of a brand new sustainable biodegradable fiber. And I'm not talking about bamboo. Uh, bamboo takes as much processing as any other viscose material. Believe it or not, the wet wipe industry globally is worth over 12 billion pounds. Think about how many wet wipes that equates to and how many wet wipes get flushed away every single day. And think what an impact it would make if we could come up with a new fiber, uh, a new sustainable fiber that could replace all of those wet wipes. Finally, uh, and I will keep this very briefly, uh, I can't really talk about the future of the industry in the UK without touching on Brexit. For an industry where 76% of our exports and 36% of our imports rely on the EU, Brexit is a significant challenge. Deal or no deal, the future trading relationship with the EU will be highly challenging, and our sector could be facing an export tariff bill of around £187 million a year. There will be a hugely complex paperwork trail and an immigration system that could have a detrimental impact on our manufacturing sector. It might surprise you to know that, uh, I keep saying here in, in Huddersfield, I'm actually in, in London, talking to you from London at the moment. Right here in London, there are over 13 and a half thousand highly skilled machinists uh, working for high-end fashion manufacturers and making for brands such as Erden, Roxander and Ralph and Russo. And over 70% of those machinists come from the EU. So in summary, um, I think innovation, skills and investment will be key in shaping the textile landscape of the future. But I think it's also worth reminding ourselves that in 5, 10 and probably even 50 years time, I strongly suspect we'll still be wearing jeans, although maybe the cotton will have been recycled many times. Our driverless cars will still have seatbelts and airbags and textiles will play an increasingly important role in the construction of everything from replacement heart valves to planes, and from energy harvesting plants to the 27th edition of the new iPhone. Now that was an incredibly brief overview of the industry, the developments, the opportunities, and the challenges. As Parik knows, I could talk about this subject um, till, uh, well, till for forever, I should think. But as I said at the beginning, I'm really keen that, that this is a discussion as much as, as, as me just talking at you all. So, Thank you very much indeed for listening uh, and I'd really like now to, to hear, hear some of your questions and see if we can have a debate and if I can't answer some of some, some queries that you might have. So over to you. Thank you so much Adam for a really good thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I, 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 I will open the floor and uh, for a question and then I'll ask I'll make a comment and then I'll ask one question and then we'll interact with the audience. Uh, one point is I, I saw somebody else mentioning that as well. And you mentioned about textile technology and textile design. You know, uh, we have to look at it holistically. If you look at our uh, undergraduate courses and I'm talking about the Department of Fashion and Textiles because that is what I know um, more than other universities and courses. See, we have a course in undergraduation where we teach textiles, textile practice. Now we have two pathways, right? One is BA pathway, one is BSc pathway. And in BSc pathway, the students uh, know enough uh, textile technology that they need for the industry, right? And I'm saying it, and I can say it with authority because my undergraduate degree was in textile technology. Now. You know, the industry has matured and move on. 
and therefore our courses need to cater the requirement of that industry as well so we have innovated ourselves in 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 uh, creating an environment where where our courses cater the need of creativity as well as technology at the same time so we are creating hybrid graduates uh, i only know it today by talking with my colleagues in costume design course that the way they are doing and you mentioned costume design so i'm mentioning that the way they do it the course is amazing because they actually realize that with new plasma television and so on and so forth the requirement of costume in television has totally changed because previously now you can actually focus on the integrated details of textiles so the students need to know about textiles in more details who are studying costumes and these courses matured themselves so they can cater that now with that comment i'll 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 uh, i'll ask some questions that came from audience uh, uh, to start with then we'll see if we can interact directly with the audience uh, uh, one of my colleague nicola redmore uh, asked a very very important question here that we really know that how important is startups to our economy and in an university like ours we are trying to do everything to promote startups and i know adam that you are trying to do everything possible to promote startup and and fresh graduates as well how can we work together so that we are giving them the transferable skills that they required or you are communicating to us what transferable skills are required and then you are helping them to can connect with the manuf uk manufacturers and so on and yeah. so forth it's it's an it's a very interesting question and it actually picks up on 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 your earlier comment about about the skills that we deliver into graduates at university i mean you're absolutely right startups are the lifeblood of our industry um i talked earlier about the thousand companies that we we take to overseas trade shows and help with exports now most of those are, are startup companies whilst we we it's very difficult to put precise numbers on startups but there's something in the reason of two and a half thousand fashion startups every year now unfortunately the failure rate for those is very very high i've lost count of the number of conversations i've had at, at trade events where someone comes up to me and says uh, i'm a lawyer uh, i've been doing it for 20 years uh, but i feel like i've lost my soul and i want to reconnect with my creativity i want to start up a fashion brand uh, I've got ten thousand pounds. How can you help me? My stock answer, and this is absolutely true, is give me the ten thousand pounds. I'll burn five thousand of it and give you the five thousand pounds back and tell you to carry on being a lawyer. Being a successful startup in this industry is incredibly difficult. It isn't good enough just to have a great idea. You need to have great business understanding. You need to understand how to sell online. You need to understand what an agency agreement is. You need to understand IP. You need to understand how to raise finance. All of those things are accessible. And the best way that we as universities and, and, and UKFT can work together the best way that I've found that people learn is by listening to other people's mistakes. One of the best ways of learning is by people standing up and saying, I did this and I got it terribly, terribly wrong. Do that, not this. Now, I think we can definitely work together um, to, to, to bring some of those sorts of, sort of people um, to, to do lectures like this to your undergraduate community, to, to reach out further into Huddersfield more generally, to talk to some of the startups out there. You know, we work with funding platforms like Crowdcube, um, who give out free advice um, to people on the UKFT Rise platform that I talked about earlier about how to go about raising. There's lots of free documentation on the Rise website again about you know what it is, how do you pitch to a buyer? You know, it's it's great that universities such as yours are teaching students uh, basic textile technology. But I have to tell you that I've lost count again of the number of buyers that I've met who don't know the difference between warp and weft. Now, that's not an exaggeration. They don't know the difference between warp and weft. They don't know the difference. You know, they don't understand what washing something at 40 degrees means as opposed to washing something at 60 degrees and how a textile will have to perform. So there's, there's lots of education that we need to do there. Sorry, I've drifted off into, into about 15 different subjects then, but I think there's <laughs> lots we can do to help support um, startup businesses. Absolutely. Now, there are some questions with me, but what I'm 
<clears throat> hoping we can do now, and this is the first time we are trying that, that between me and Rachel, we can take some direct question from the audience. Great. Uh, if uh, people who want to ask a question raise their hand, then me and Rachel will try our best to manage that. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's quite a few coming into the chat box. Sorry, I know, um, Parikh, you've been listening to Ad, um, Adam, so we won't have been able to see them. For those people, if they did want to ask their question, that's absolutely fine. Um, I know we had one at the very beginning from someone, um, and I'm just quite aware that obviously it's been recorded. So if people don't want to be on camera, um, okay. at the very beginning, we had some, re uh, some Rita, and they asked, textile industry get lost during this pandemic? pandemic so many labor lost their jobs now textile earnings more everything is getting expensive so labor is getting double payment means there there is their industry paying them better now sorry i'm just trying to decide the question yeah it's, it's it's i mean i think there's a couple of points to unravel in there i mean i think as i said at, said at the beginning um there has been dramatic uh job losses in the industry and if i just look at the uk as an example, and I know there's been job losses across the whole of, uh, oh. of the globe. In the UK, we unfortunately think we'll lose somewhere between 15 and 25% of our manufacturing workforce because of COVID. Um, most manufacturers at the moment are operating at about 40% capacity. Some of that's due to social distancing requirements, but most of that's due to a lack of orders. And when you look at places like Bangladesh, there's been absolutely decimated by the pretty unsavory actions of uh, major global retailers and brands cancelling orders left, right and centre. One of the things that we need to do as an industry, um, and I talked about it quite a lot, is to make careers in making things attractive. And that doesn't matter whether we're talking about a factory in Bangladesh, a factory in China, Thailand, you name it. One of the ways of making careers in making things attractive is for people to pay decent salaries. Um, there's no getting away from that. If our local weavers in Huddersfield want to compete for the best school leavers, there's no point paying offering six pounds an hour if stacking shelves at Tesco's or Sainsbury's is going to pay nine pounds an hour. We have to invest in young people. We have to invest in the skills and that involves paying higher salaries. So it is difficult. Uh, and at the same time, we then have the issues. And again, I referred to this very briefly at the beginning. We've got issues uh, around fast fashion. You know, how is it possible for some of the fast fashion retailers to sell dresses for four or five pounds a dress? Um, the only way that that is possible, it appears, is by someone down the supply chain um, being exploited. And quite often that means not paying people legal salaries, wages. And that happens again that happens <laughs> in the UK just as much as that happens around the rest of the world, unfortunately. So there's lots of elements to that answer. Um, but yes, the simple one is we all need to think about the value of the clothing that we all buy, because it's no point just pinning the blame on government or pinning the blame on retail or pinning the blame on fast fashion companies. We're the ones who buy it. You know, if we didn't all buy stuff at four quid for a dress, and I understand it's very attractive, I wouldn't look good in a four pound dress. It's a very attractive proposition. But if something is that cheap, you have to ask yourself why. And you have to think about, should I buy less and should I buy better? Yeah. And that actually, Adam, answers some of the questions that we have from audience. Means, uh, I, I will reframe uh, uh, one question from Julia. Uh, because that relates to how you answered this one. Because yes, I mean, uh, we have to think about the consumer behavior with material, but still there is a circular uh, economy aspect that we have to tackle because we have yep. to change how our waste is dealt with. I know this, uh, me and you interacted with this topic very recently, but it will be very good to know your view on that as Textile Association of UK with many stakeholders. Yep, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the important things to, 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 to note on, on this area, and, and I saw something just pop up in the chat now, is, you know, there's always been circular economy in, in, in fashion and textiles. But there's always been secondhand clothes. There's always been the opportunity to go down a charity shop and find a bargain. And, and long may that continue. And there's also been forever a textile waste recycling industry. Um, again, just around the corner from, from Huddersfield, there's a company that... Um, takes recycled, takes scraps and very simply puts them through an enormous shredding machine. 
But what comes out the other end is used in the most high-end um, acoustic industries to provide dampening. It's used in all the best recording studios and stuff like that. So there's always been that industry. What there hasn't necessarily been, and what there isn't yet, is a way in which retailers and potentially local councils make it easy for us to recycle our textiles. We all have busy lives and quite often we're all quite lazy. And you know, I'm talking about me here, not necessarily all of you guys. We need to make it as easy as possible for us to take our old t-shirts and drop them in a bin when we buy a new one or drop them on the you know, curbside recycling system. But that's only one part of the problem. Now we have curbside re recycling already and unfortunately some of that ends up in landfill or we ship it to poorer parts of the world and dump it on them, which doesn't actually solve any of the problems. There's lots and lots of uh, innovation opportunities and challenges around how do we break down existing garments in, you know, particularly mixed fiber garments. How do we strip out cotton as opposed to polyester? That major recycling infrastructure doesn't exist yet, but it will come. Um, you know, we've seen, you only have to look at what's happened with the recycling of PET bottles as an example. Is it perfect? No. Is there plastic around the world? Yes. But the recycling of plastic bottles, the recycling of plastic bags, even the recycling of glass bottles. I mean, if you look at the recycling of glass bottles, that's, you know, the, the stuff that we, you know, when I finish my bottle of wine on a Friday night and put the, the thing in the recycling, it ends up as sand or ends up as, as, as road surface and motorways and things like that. So there's lots of ways we can, we can work. And it also involves replacing some of those less, the, the more damaging materials, particularly those oil, oil based fibers. You know, if we can replace some of those with, things like the coffee grounds that I talked around, the, the, the potatoes, the bananas, the pineapples, you know, there's lots and lots of ways in which we can help the circular economy. But I think, you know, it, it is quite easy at the moment to shop sustainably in so much as you can buy lots of mm. brands um, that have a sustainable story. A lot of that material is accessible only to those that have got um, a fair amount of disposable income. And we need to make sure that the cheaper end of the fashion industry is able to provide sustainable materials just as much as the expensive end. Yeah. Mitch, I'll, I'll just add a bit to that. Uh, we are already talking, and by we, I mean as a community, me, you, and others, with the civic society. So we are talking with LEP, we are talking with the combined authority, so that we can actually tackle the problem uh, from its root. So we are trying to... Uh, map out the waste that is generated and try to tackle it accordingly. And, and the industry as a whole is really thinking about a holistic solution. I think uh, uh, Charlie Ross uh, is happy, wants to ask a question uh, directly and, and both Adam and I know Charlie. So uh, do you want right, to- Thank you. Uh, Adam doesn't know me. He's not been warned against me yet. Adam. All right, I am. I am. So it's all right. <laughs> Thoroughly enjoyed that that presentation. But to go right into a serious question, um, the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee last year produced Fixing Fashion, and it got kicked out by the government. None of the 18 recommendations was adopted at all. Fortunately, the current Environmental Audit Committee is trying to push it through under a different title ethics and sustainability in in fashion because the industry is worth 35 billion pounds to our economy um it's to ask your view what went wrong last year why did it fail last year and why do you have hope that the current thing led by baroness young and catherine west might stand a chance I think it failed for two diametrically opposed reasons. It didn't ask for enough, uh, but at the same time, it asked for too much, which is a slightly odd answer, I grant you. Um, it, it demanded, as, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key problems is that we don't have that um, immediate recycling uh, um, supply chain, basically. So we don't have the opportunity to dump stuff as individuals, and nor do we have the um, factories that can process it. And it made an immediate demand that this should just appear overnight. Well, things like that don't appear overnight. And in some cases, the science isn't as good as we would hope it to be. 
Um, and then they asked for a tax on retailers, um, and that just didn't go down terribly well with the government, never mind the retailers. And the tax that they were talking about didn't go far enough. So we've only raised, you'll forgive me if I get the figures wrong, but I think it was only going to raise 30 million quid, something like that, which in terms of building a recycling infrastructure just is a drop in the ocean. I think if the new, I'm aware of the, the new activity, I think like so many things at the moment, it's going to get lost in the COVID um, maelstrom. But I think if they start to work with retailers rather than making retailers out to be the devil incarnate in all things to do with this industry, they'll get a lot further. We need to work with all bits of the supply chain and that involves retailers, that involves the boohoos and the misguided of this world. We need to get them to make it easier for us as consumers. And if we can do that bit, if the new Environment and Order Committee can, can connect those bits together, then I think there's going to be a much greater opportunity. You know, it's quite, I don't know, I'm sure many people have seen that the MS recycling scheme um, that they were doing with Oxfam has just come on back on stream again. So there's lots of things that people are doing. And government select committees, and I've been on the receiving end of them on a number of occasions, are very good at bashing industry. And they assume that it's, that it's all industry's fault and there's nothing that government can do to uh, help. Well, there is, you know, government have got access to pots and pots of money. Innovate UK could be given a pot of money to make sure that all of our industries can work together to, to develop these sorts of things. So there's so many different bits of the supply chain that need to work together on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm getting conscious of time, but, uh... Adam, uh, just before we end, I'm very keen that, say for example, uh, uh, A-level student uh, who have to decide, and, and I don't want to take it lightly, right? At one point, we made a decision to commit our life towards textile and fashion. It's a tough decision to make. So your message towards them, and the second set of message, uh, the second message to a set of students who are just finishing their, say, undergraduate courses or master's courses at this time, they really need some ray of light now, right? So mm -hmm. what is your message to those two sets of students? So for those sort of at the 16 to 18 um, age level, I'd, I'd tell them to think very broadly in terms of if they're interested in careers in creativity, if they're interested in careers in science, if they're interested in careers in making things, if they don't think they're very bright academically, think about fashion and textiles for all of those roles, all of those people, all of those different skill sets, whether they're academic or vocational, there is a job out there for you. We, we run a series of uh, promo pieces called Manufacturing Heroes, and one went out yesterday, which is about a uh, a young guy also called Adam, who now works at DP Dyers up in just around the corner from you guys. He's now the head dyer. He's still under 30. Um, he did terribly badly at school, wasn't academic, didn't want to learn, but he did an apprenticeship. He's now the head dyer at one of the world's most prestigious dyers, and he's not 30. There are fantastic opportunities in this industry for, for 16 to 18 year olds. When it comes to those that are uh, doing a degree now or are, or are coming close to finishing their degree, again, look more broadly. Don't all expect to be the next John Galliano, the next Stella McCartney. Those guys are rare and far and few between. Make sure that as well as your creative learning, you learn all around business as well. The more you know about the business of fashion as well as the creativity of fashion, the much more likely you are to succeed whether that's establishing a brand on your own or whether that's working for a retailer or a wholesaler. There are loads and loads of opportunities out there. Um, and, you know, follow your dreams by all means, but make sure you've got the skills behind you to develop in this fantastic industry. Great, Adam. Mint, uh, for the audience, I want to say this is the beginning of this dialogue and there will be so many other speakers, some of them actually attending today uh, with so much of knowledge about this industry. So we we want people to know about this industry, get engaged with this uh, uh, series, which is just a platform so that people from this industry and stakeholders can engage together. So 
please uh, join the other lecture series as well and on behalf of the department of fashion and textiles and the school of art design and architecture and university of huddersfield i want to really really thank adam uh, for coming today for sharing his experience uh, uh, with us thank you so much adam it's been my absolute pleasure thank you very much indeed all for listening thank you and i'm so happy that as a chair i did my job to end the meeting at exactly the perfect time thank you so much everybody for attending <laughs>